Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. Hey there, welcome back. Why don't you join me in a moment of relaxation here? Because today, we're talking about Diminish, an unfiction series that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I was introduced to this series by a friend who wishes to remain anonymous, but I must confess, a lot of my thoughts and analysis that I have about this series so far has come from long conversations with that friend, so I can't in good conscience tell you that every single thought that I bring up in this series is entirely my own. So right now, I just want to take a moment to thank that anonymous friend uh, for introducing me to something uh, that I can actually be a fan of. I haven't been a fan of something in a while. Sure, I've really liked a bunch of the projects that I've covered on this series and really admired a lot of the creators of them, but whenever I was working on them, I was working on them in the context of work. For instance, Petscop is amazing, but I had never watched Petscop until I was watching it to take notes for a video about it. So even though it's amazing, I never got to experience it in just the fan context. But I didn't even think I was going to make a video about Diminish when I first started. But after I got to the end, I was just like, I have to make a video about this. And I wanted to take this quick breather before we get into it, because we're not in spooky FNAF VHS territory anymore. This is something that covers some pretty serious topics, uh, and some has some complex discussions about mental health and things like that. So it can be a lot, as I've noted by watching. But it can also be very cathartic. So with one last deep breath, let's get into a little more analytical mood. Can we get some color in here? Great, thanks. Uh, last thing before we get into it, I just want to shout out uh, the fact that, number one, the song that was the end of my Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach video is now on Spotify, along with an album that I have been working on over the past year uh, of just original music. So if you're interested in that, go check that out. And also just check out Diminish and Saria's other work it's it's really great anyway let's get into it okay let's start with some background and context so like what is diminish well without getting too far into like spoilers here's the basic deal diminish is an unfiction web series that takes the format of a let's play series will our player is the only person who owns a copy of this game he's playing the titular diminish a game for my brother from the title, you can probably guess that the game was created by his sibling, exclusively for him. The game itself is a precision platformer along the lines of Celeste or Super Meat Boy. So there's the most basic gist possible, a let's play of a fictional game created specifically for the player by his sibling. Before we get into all the little details of the series, I think it's important that we touch on the context around the genre that the game is in, because the choice of this type of game is actually very important to the themes and the story. Like I said, it's a precision platformer teetering on rage game at times. It requires an immense amount of precision and trial and error to move from place to place, with very few checkpoints and at times the game actually tricks the player, for instance with floors that just don't have collision. And again, the choice for this to be this type of game was a purposeful one, so I think talking a bit about precision platformers and rage games is a good starting point. I think a good place to start is Super Meat Boy. It's not that this was the first precision platformer. Platformers from the start have been made with precision in mind, going back to the days of arcades, where the difficulty was placed specifically to pull as many coins out of players as possible. But Super Meat Boy fully embraced certain aspects that are now well established in the precision platform genre, and is a clear inspiration from pretty much all games in the genre that came after. It placed specific emphasis on how many times you died. The game didn't give you a certain number of tries before you were sent back to the beginning of the world, it relished in every failed attempt at clearing a stage, with an infinite amount of lives. And unlike, say, a Mario game, which plays a sad tune when you die with a little animated sequence, Super Meat Boy sends you back into the action right away, no waiting. 
and when you finally do pass the level, you're greeted with a rather wild visual. Every failed attempt playing all at once, again relishing in the amount of times you've died. In the same vein, the character of Meat Boy leaves bloody reminders of wherever he's been, especially when he dies, meaning every spike or saw that kills you keeps its blood stain from your previous attempts. But the game never feels like it's insulting the player for failing. The game was built to be incredibly difficult, and there are some portions where there's no way you can know how to beat the level without dying a few times. Instead, seeing all of your failed attempts play out, finally ending with your success, it feels gratifying. You feel more accomplished looking back at how many times you've tried and how you slowly learned the level. Because in this game, dying is not a failure, it's the process. It's an integral part of the journey and that idea is very important when applied to Diminish. But also when applied to other games that Diminish draws inspiration from. And in general, a lot of games thrive on their difficulty. And games like these, of course, are ripe for things like speedrunning. For the two of you who are unfamiliar, speedrunning is the hobby or at times profession of playing games as fast as possible, pushing the human limit as to how quickly it is physically possible to complete a game, split second reaction times, pixel perfect maneuvers. In a lot of ways, it's similar to more conventional athletics. And much like conventional athletics and games like Celeste and Super Meat Boy, a huge part of the sense of accomplishment comes from trying over and over and over and over until finally you succeed. Sorry. Episode 1, November 7th, 2020, simply titled Diminish 1. Will introduces himself as the player of this game, the sole person with a copy. He has never played the game until now. He alludes to this being a part of a promise he has to fulfill, to play this game after something that happened four years ago. Since then, he's been putting it off, but is finally embarking on the journey. We're also introduced to his cat, who shows up here and there throughout the series. It opens with a monologue from the creator of the game, Will Sibling, introducing Will to the game and to the character he's playing as, Apollo. We also see right away that the game falls into this space between precision platformer and straight up rage game, which is why I, it was so important to talk about them before. In fact, there's a explicit reference to I want to be the guy in Celeste. After encountering a dying figure who wishes to be left alone, Will's mood noticeably shifts from nervous but happy to slightly more uncomfortable and sad. You'll also notice that Apollo's status changes from curious to sad. This is important because the status doesn't just track Apollo's mood, it tracks Will's mood. As things happen in the game and Will's mood changes, the status changes to reflect that. There are a few ways to interpret this. One, the creator of the game knew Will so well they knew exactly what reaction he'd have to each part of the game, and as we learn about the nature of their relationship, that actually sounds pretty believable. Two, it's simply a fun narrative device slash easter egg that doesn't necessarily have a deep explanation. Or you could just see it as an almost supernatural element of the game. Personally, I'm not convinced that there's anything supernatural going on, but it felt worth pointing out. Anyway, the dying man definitely brought the mood down. Will pops the menu up and we can see there's all sorts of different mechanics and aspects of this game we haven't seen yet. An inventory, notes, a photo album, and really importantly, a soup of the day. Soup of the Day shows off a monologue from the game's creator about different soups. 
Most of the time, they use soup or their memories of a soup to tie into how the game's creator is feeling. This time, it's about how today they feel like cold soup. This yet again brings the mood down. Thus ends Diminish One. Will picks up basically where he left off, after having an unfortunate power outage. As he continues through the level, there's a section where Apollo has to land on another dead or dying man's back. It's unavoidable, but clearly done on purpose. After making a difficult jump, he sees some sort of item that would require quite a tricky maneuver to get to, so Will ignores it for now. Importantly, while it ends up later being revealed to be a martial arts belt, Will initially thinks that it's a gun. This foreshadows some plot points to come. The episode ends with Will making it farther than he has before, only to die right before he can see what's on the other side. This is an early cliffhanger that the series will do increasingly well. In this episode, Will continues to try and get to that next section, and we learn a little bit more about his sibling. It was his sister, and apparently, she only had a few months to create this game. Will also elaborates slightly on his history with Rage games, most notably that he had a really hard time with them. No doubt this is the reason why his sister chose this genre in the first place. We also see Apollo remark on the pause screen that he has been summoned for nothing but torment. It's important to note that while Apollo is the character that Will is playing as, Apollo is a separate character with his own storyline inside the game that is separate but at times very much a stand-in for Will's story. There's a section here where Will's cat jumps on his desk, and while he's distracted, we see the screen flash. Assuming this is Morse code, it spells out, well, sort of nonsense, but I've seen it translated as an anagram as either setting ideas or seeing it. After finally reaching this new area, the music begins to build, and Will finds some sort of strange thing growing out of the ground as the screen turns red. Right as he goes to touch it, the video ends. Another fantastic cliffhanger. It starts with an in-game explanation of the cliffhanger. Right when he touched it, the game crashed. Now he's setting his sights on that gun. During his attempts to successfully get the gun, he explains a bit more about the situation that led to all of this, albeit in a way that is still sort of shrouds it in mystery. The game seems to at least in some way be helping him address or deal with all of the emotions and feelings he's had since that thing happened four years ago, and he implies pretty heavily what it was. His sister, the creator of this game, died. More context around the circumstances of that will be revealed later, and how they play into some of the more ominous and depressing imagery and monologues we've seen. But on the note of ominous monologues, Will looks at the soup of the day, to see now it is lobster bisque. This soup has Will's sister recount her memories of seeing lobster being prepared in the kitchen as a child. She hated lobster being prepared, the whole concept around boiling something alive. At times, the mere presence of lobster would drive her out of the house. Other times, she would sit and watch, shocked and disturbed, but entranced by it nonetheless. She remarks, I am the one on the stove now. Also worth noting, this eerie face is visible in the main menu at this point, which recurs seemingly at random throughout the series. Either way, he does successfully collect the gun, which reveals itself to be a belt, which now gives him a melee attack, although we have seen no enemies as of yet. Now, his journey to move on through the level begins again. He gets back to the spot with the strange red glowing and growing thing, and when he moves to touch it, we get a flash of some creepy imagery, and the video yet again ends. This episode starts with Will booting up the game for the first time since the last episode. And when he does, instead of being back at the red area, he's back at the first checkpoint, but things have changed. It seems that picking up the belt has made the game enter a new phase. Enemies now litter the level, affectionately nicknamed Comboys, along with more strange growths that shoot lasers. When he comes back to where the dying man once was, it's nothing but rotted remains. In the area where the other body laid is now one of the laser enemies, who speaks to Apollo, pleading for death rather than to be left to this fate, slowly being overtaken by this strange growth. So, although it clearly makes Will uncomfortable, he grants their wish and kills them. Now, where the gun was, there's some sort of note, which Will decides to go for right away. After picking it up, it's added to his inventory in a subclass of scrap papers, although this scrap paper only says hi. As Will continues, his sister chimes in via text box to lament that she won't be there to see him play this game, but that the connection they have through the game is still there nonetheless. Episode 6 continues from where Will left off last in the game, attempting to just move on to a new section. When he finally does, the dev's text appears again, this time saying that she is losing her nerve. She's not so sure Will is even playing the game. Will responds with, No, 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 I'm here. I'm here. I'm here, Teddy. I'm here. I'm here. 
I'm seeing it. So we finally have a name. From here on, we'll be calling Will's sister, the creator of the diminished game, Teddy. Now, in this new version of the level with enemies, when Will gets to the place that turned red before, there's a sort of tree with a woman growing out of it. Or probably more aptly, there's a woman who's being consumed by this tree, presumably the same type of growth that overtook the poor guy from before. Will approaches and more text from Teddy appears. I'll be straightforward about this, this tree person is a representation of Teddy in the game, a sort of Teddy diminish OC self-insert, so we can assume this is where all the dialogue is coming from. Also worth noting, the status changes to I know you too well. This possibly reinforces the idea that Teddy just knows Will so well that she can predict what his mood will be in reaction to things, therefore updating the status accurately. Teddy's chosen words for the cliffhanger of this episode are, you have to move on. Here we see Will continuing to explore some earlier sections of the stage, presumably looking for more secrets. While in the menu, he finds a bios page of different characters, starting with Apollo. Read at your leisure. Perhaps most noteworthy though is Apollo's strengths being otherworldly athleticism and artistry. I told you those things would come into play, but we're just scratching the surface on that, so stay tuned. Otherwise, we learn a bit more about Apollo. They're an immortal Olympian, keep that in mind, with a bit of an ego, but still extremely powerful and brings light to those around them. There's also Unknown Voice, who we can presume is Teddy, with all the it's me's and assuming she is in fact no longer alive, the too young in her age section. Then the dying man from the very beginning, whose blurb tells us that at a certain point, the unwillingness to accept and look after oneself closes the door to the realm of selflessness. To me, this message is a warning. Do not let your selflessness fall into a trap of being unable or unwilling to help yourself or seek help from others. Because from there, you're not helping anyone, and that's not very selfless, is it? We also get to see the other dying figure, who got turned into a laser enemy, but the message is pretty similar. Will then looks at the soup of the day, which is tomato soup this time. There's this wonderful part. It's not just a tomato, it's not just... Oh, okay, you freaking... <laughs> I think it's weirdly nice to see how well they knew each other, that they can almost have a conversation, even though one of them isn't really there. Teddy uses this soup to voice her frustrations with, well, I think just saying social media is a bit of a reduction, it's more than that, but it uses social media as a way to talk about this sort of vindictive crusade that people seem to be on. This way that people take every viewpoint or conflict as a hill to die on, a reason to dive into battle for the cause, from politics to fandom. And everyone is sure that they are the ones in the right, completely unaware of the actual harm they can cause. At least that's what I got from it. Teddy then reflects on her own impact, what she left behind, how she fits into this structure as the nice one. And then Apollo shares some notes. Sleepies reveals how Apollo has been on some sort of hiatus, which has finally brought his physical perfection down a peg. Still better than any of us can hope to achieve, but for a narcissistic god, he's not quite where he wants to be. Weakness continues to explore Apollo's atrophying body, and while there is a comedic overtone to everything, Apollo's fixation on his physical appearance shining through, we do learn of a deeper self-doubt of his effects on people, and even a hint at some sort of travesty that may have caused some of his hiatus, and how uncertain he is now that he's back. Reaper continues to explore Apollo's self-doubt since returning. He has left nothing but destruction in his wake and has become a Reaper, only helping those by offering them a quick death. We move on to episode 8. Episode 8 and 9 are sort of a package deal here, but 8 is titled slightly differently, Broken Promise Draft. Moving to the description before we get into the video, we see this message from Will. I am a very weak person. In keeping with that, I have broken my word and taken down the real version of this video, with my real reaction to what happened on screen. Obviously, my sister's soul means less to me than some shallow embarrassment over raising my voice. I'm sorry. It all happened before the shame could speak up. I already got rid of the real audio. I really don't know if there's anyone worse than me at making decisions. I never deserved her friendship. Man, reading that makes me want to give Will a hug. The poor guy is incredibly hard on himself. But what this helps explain is why in Diminish 9, there's no audio from Will. If I'm getting all my info right here, I believe there was an original version of Diminish 8 and 9 as one video that did have audio, but then was deleted and split into these two. 
Diminish 8 is the setup to what caused Will to have such a big reaction that he felt embarrassed enough to remove it. Diminish 9 is that thing. Diminish 8 shows Will following the suggestion of a comment. He's copied a brand new version of the game and is starting before he's even reached the first checkpoint. The idea is jumping into the spikes without having set a respawn point. And so he tries it. Let's do it. which leads us to Diminish 9. What can I even say about Diminish 9? Oh, here's one thing, go watch it. It is so fantastic, so well written, moving, genuinely impactful art that you'd be doing a disservice to yourself if you didn't watch. With that said, let's talk about it. Apollo's dive into the spikes triggers a cutscene. Apollo lays there impaled by spikes. While he is immortal, he isn't infallible. For now, Apollo is stuck in terrible agony. Will has many options. Check on them, call their name, comfort them, leave, wait. But they don't do anything. Life moves on. Grass grows. A butterfly flaps its wings. The world keeps turning. A child is bullied, and the rest of their life alters irrevocably. This continues. The lines now shift, talking about an Olympian in training, sitting in a hospital bed, just having received news that she has cancer. Stage 4. The text follows her spiral from this news, from prayer to hatred, anger to despair. I'll let you guys guess who that woman is for now. Now, continuing to summarize this video, I feel like it's a disservice. I'm only making its message less impactful by being a middleman. So please, go watch it. Even while writing this section, I'm getting a bit emotional. It's that good. But for consistency's sake, and to let you get an idea of what happens in the episode, here are a few choice lines from what happens next. Because after a long while of continuing, Apollo speaks up. Pain is mortal. It can be outlived. If you let pain die while you still live, something goes wrong. I think you're supposed to make room, so it has somewhere to stay with you. You can nurture it into something else. I choose to make this moment a gift. I'm forced to survive this, but I will grow from it on my own. I'm reminded how lucky I really am, because my spine is severed, and yet I can feel every single nerve in my legs pleading for death. Which means, it's time to stand up. Holy shit. Actual goosebumps. Again, if you haven't, go watch it yourself because there is no way I've done it justice. But really, truly, keep the message this episode has in mind. About overcoming adversity and pain. About taking it with you to nurture it into something else. About getting the fuck back up. Because that is one of the most important themes this series carries and it permeates every aspect of it. With that said, we're at the halfway point of Act 1 now, so let's take another breather. Okay, another quick breather. I'm here in my zen zone yet again. So far, we're slowly getting an idea of exactly what happened here. Teddy and Will are siblings, and Teddy created this game for Will for, it seems like, a variety of reasons. One of which to be Connect, another reason may be to help him deal with grief and loss, another reason may be to just cope with her own mortality because she made it while she knew she was dying. We're also following the story of Apollo and what exactly happened to this strange world that we're in with these weird monsters and growths and stuff. Uh, there's sort of those two narratives overlapping, the in-game narrative and then the sort of meta-game narrative and then the more direct narrative of Will actually trying to complete the game. But let's not stay here too long, let's move on to Diminished 10. Diminish 10 opens with the same file from the last episode. Will has spent his time getting back to the same spot from before on this new file. The enemies, the belt, etc. He also opens by saying he's found a new area by moving to the left. While he works on moving through this new area, he begins to explain a bit more directly about what's even going on. His twin sister, Theodora, who went by Teddy in her childhood, was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer and passed away a few months later. She was an Olympic level swimmer, see what I mean about keeping the topics and themes around athleticism and specifically Apollo's choice of being an Olympian? This stuff permeates the series. And a hobby artist. Teddy made the game in a few months, and Will and Teddy made a deal. 
When she's gone, Will would play the game, record it, and upload it, cutting none of his emotional reactions and not re-recording anything. This is the reason there was the broken promise draft and why Will was so upset. He broke his promise to leave his emotional reactions. And also worth mentioning, Will begins to start throwing in little edits, making the videos feel more and more like an actual Let's Play. When Will makes it to the top of this new area, he is greeted by a giant skull, who tells him, I am coming for you. And just like he said, it begins a blind chase sequence, which Will dies on his first attempt. Or, I shouldn't say dies, because since episode 9, the deaths counter has been replaced with a tries counter. Very nice touch. Either way, this is where Will decides to leave episode 10. This episode starts with a soup of the day. This time, it's hot and sour soup. Here, Teddy uses the fact that some people ruin the soup by not fully embracing the weirdness of it to talk about what Will call cringe culture. The fear of being too sincere, the way people will make fun of someone or something for simply being itself to the fullest. Because something is different or because something is weird, there's something wrong with it, and how the idea of being cringe is viewed as this terrible fate that can both stop people from enjoying things and make people lash out at those who are confident enough or yet unaware of their own cringe. This writing then shifts focus specifically to how Will was treated in school, being bullied and put down from all sides, and from Teddy's point of view, seeing his passionate personality slowly dulled by those around him. She talks about how she used that anger at the world to push her in swimming, or else she might have put that energy somewhere more harmful. We also learn why the collectibles in the game so far have been carrots. Will was bullied for eating peanut butter and carrots in school. Teddy alludes to a friend or classmate named Mikey, who she misses every day, heavily implying to me that he lost his life to Zasus at the hands of constant bullying. And then Teddy recalls when she had to talk Will out of doing the same. She ends this monologue with a request. Enjoy some carrots and peanut butter for her. Will comes back after collecting himself, and he finds a secret chest full of carrots. Then, Will gets back to working on the skull chase, with some fun dialogue between Apollo and the skull between each try. This episode ends with Will sitting down and eating some carrots and peanut butter. Oh my god. I wish we had crunchy. This episode is more of just Will trying to get past the skull, and we learn the skull's name, Justin. Thank you, Justin, for being a cool skull. However, by the end, Will is still not moved past the chase. This episode shows Will finding another secret scrap paper, Hurt. And after countless more attempts at the Justin chase sequence, he finally makes it. To find a woman just... Chillin'. She's not much now, but remember her, because she will be. Moving forward, he finds a tree, much like the one from early, early on in the game, with the false floor. Recognizing this, he hypes himself up and dives forward, hoping to make it. And he does. Temporarily. Teddy! You bitch! I miss you, but I hate you so much! I'm taking a break. Whoa! Okay, this one is heavy. Content warning for all of this stuff. Will has discovered some documents that Teddy left behind about Diminish. This will come into play later as well, but for now, they let Will in on how to enter a debug mode. Along with that, Teddy issues almost a warning. Things are hidden for a reason. If you really want to see everything, and then instructions for how to enter a debug mode. Will is hoping this can help him with the invisible pitfalls. But this debug mode isn't all that it seems. Now, as he plays through the game, images flash on screen. The aftermath of the bombing of Hiroshima, and a photo of Adolf Hitler. The faces of multiple mass murderers and serial killers whose names I won't even give the time of day. Images of Jonestown. Justin is now distorted and decaying. One of the images that pops up is completely censored, and the description informs us uh, this is for privacy reasons. Now, considering how much of this series is coming from Sayria directly, and for another reason I'll explain in a second, I don't want to try and theorize about, ooh, what was the censored thing? Because, in all honesty, it doesn't really matter too much. The point that is being made was made. 
The only thing I can think of is something related to Mikey, but again, I'm not sure we're ever supposed to know, and I don't think it's super important exactly what it was, other than that it was likely something tied to Will and Teddy's personal life. After many of these images appear, Teddy's text chimes in. I'm leaving the real disease behind. Will ends the episode by saying, I'm sorry, but no. I don't want to do it this way. Personally, when I first watched this, I thought it was a very dark but necessary characterization of Teddy, and I think it fits really well. But understandably, some people felt that the use of these images were put in for cheap shock value. And while you may not like the episode, I think it's important to understand where this was coming from. Firstly, it released on January 7th, 2021. If you'll remember, right around that time, a pretty big and scary historical event went down in the United States. If you feel at all put off by this episode, I'd recommend watching a video that I've included in the description, where Seiria gives some of his thoughts about why exactly he made that episode. It doesn't mean you have to like the episode, but it does give a little bit more context, and I think it's a useful watch. With that said, episode 15. Will, in slightly, if only very slightly, higher spirits, continues by attempting to get across the invisible gap section yet again, really making it his main goal. Going through, he runs into a dying man who wishes to die alone, and when he comes by for another attempt, the man is dead. As he goes through the motions, he explains a little bit about Teddy's headspace. Will worries that people might have gotten an inaccurate impression of Teddy. She wasn't some sick, twisted person. She was genuinely kind, loving, and optimistic. But she also wrestled with how evil the world could be. The best way I can describe it from my own personal experience with those types of feelings is loving people so much that you hate them for what they will do to each other. He also begins talking about what role Diminish is playing in his life. And one of the more surprising aspects is that he is now becoming an entertainer through what he's doing. I think this starts tying into Will's slow introduction of edits, not just for time, but for comedic effect, let's say. As he continues, one of his deaths leads to a cutscene. Teddy sits in a red void. Text appears on screen that seems to be a part of a conversation. Especially with what we will see a bit later, I think it's fair to assume this is a conversation in Will and Teddy's household in the past. And with that, Will ends the episode. This opens with a new note from Apollo. Wins. Apollo reflects on their immortality, their personal growth, and their current state of having been awakened again. Another death leads to another cutscene with Teddy, revealing more conversations. This time, it's from Teddy's perspective, having teachers or school staff call her in to talk about her brother, Will. They are concerned about Will because he doesn't hang around many other kids and doesn't participate in other school activities like sports or extracurriculars. Teddy tries to explain to them that he's very fulfilled in his own hobbies and passions, but whoever she's talking to undermines her at every turn, in favor of talking down to her and her brother, who isn't there to defend himself. One thing especially to note is the end line. People in positions of authority constantly compared her to Will, with the emphasis that Teddy was the better twin. Not only putting the responsibility of Will's success, or his traditional success, on her, but I would also imagine carrying over a sense of guilt when she accomplishes things, knowing that people will use it as a comparison to pass judgment on Will. Later, as Will goes on, Teddy chimes in to reflect on what the game will be putting Will through, but she emphasizes that that is the point, confronting the feelings and the challenges that he will have to face from here on. She is determined that while she still can, she will help Will have a future. The episode ends with a particularly demoralizing attempt, and uh, Fuck! from here we're on to the real finale of Diminish Act 1. There is an 18th episode which I'll talk about, but this is really the climax to this act. At almost an hour long, it's a doozy. It opens with a dedication to seven-time Tetris world champion Jonas Neubauer, who passed away on January 5th, 2021. Will continues to move through the invisible pitfall section, and while he would very much like to move past this section, he also worries that he may be getting closer to the end of the game, and the thought of it ending is even more terrifying. Emotions and tensions run high, as Will's tally of tries continues to rise, and things become more and more difficult to actually make progress. Another death leads to another conversation cutscene, this time showing a conversation play out between Will and his parents. They've taken away access to one of his passions, games, or possibly music, as we'll see later in the series, or whatever. It doesn't really matter what it is. They've taken something away from him that he looks forward to every day, because they want him to focus on a real craft. Right after, the conversation moves to Teddy's swim meet. This is so well done, both showing a piece of Will's childhood and trauma, giving more depth to him as a character, but 
Also, Teddy's specific inclusion at the end ties in yet again into that feeling of guilt she feels. So much said in such a little piece. Speaking of, another death leads to another conversation. This time, a conversation between Teddy and Will as kids. Teddy tells Will that she's afraid to die, and asks if they try, will they be able to live forever? Will says, if you do, I will. And Teddy agrees. The last frame before it disappears, Teddy, I'm guessing now present time, in-game Teddy, says, I shouldn't have said that, and she looks directly into the camera. Yet more tries, emotional tension building, it builds more and more until Will actually does it. At the top of this new area is a man. He talks about how the valley used to be filled with water flowing from this point, but it slowly waned until everything dried up. He then reflects on the end of the world, and if we've reached it at this point. Then he tells Apollo that he feels like they're there to help. Will moves slowly forward, still on the verge of death at any time since there still hasn't been a checkpoint. He inches forward to find some water. Sure that it is a trap, he plans to jump over it to the other side and finds a strange altar. He also finds a secret path through the wall. There, he just finds a sign that says he's better off without hope. After trying to explore any other possible directions, Will misses a jump and lands in the water. Turns out, it wasn't a trap. Apollo can swim. Now, still without a checkpoint, Will has to take a swim of faith, going on an unknown depth with a limited amount of breath to see what's next. At the bottom, he finds a water orb and Teddy. We get another conversation cutscene, another one between Teddy and Will. It's pretty obvious what this conversation is. Teddy is talking Will out of taking his own life. Will says he only exists to hold Teddy back, but Teddy tells him, that he has to keep on living, to prove everyone wrong. The cutscene ends and things begin to shake. It's your move. And now Will has a countdown to get back to the surface, dodging spikes, swimming for his very life. He breaks the surface with just a second to spare, gets the water orb to the altar, and the screen explodes with a white and we see the sun. As Apollo falls through the sky, we cut back and forth between a conversation between Will and Teddy, sometime after they've already made the deal about playing Diminish. I can't handle this so <laughs> Please don't kill me. I'm here. I'm right here. The end. Well, kinda. Let's just go over the final Diminish Act 1 episode, 18, trying suggestions in level 1. This episode is basically Will trying user suggestions in a slightly more edited video. Most of the suggestions don't lead anywhere, but there is a new soup of the day, potato soup. 
Teddy tells Will that he doesn't have to read this one and he can stop it at any time. She talks about how she gave up foods like potato soup when she became an athlete and had to more precisely control her diet. Now that she's dying, there's no reason for her to keep this diet up, but her brain won't let her give that up. That would mean giving in. At the same time, she wants so badly to be able to enjoy things like potato soup or pizza again, but she's caught in this loop of torment. And then she criticizes herself for her solution to this, making diminish, which will undoubtedly cause Will to feel torment as well. Now, Will doesn't often speak much about the things Teddy says in this game. He leaves Teddy to just say them and mostly, aside from a few exceptions, doesn't try to explain anything to the audience. But he comments on this soup of the day. And it's very powerful, and like this whole series, I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to you all just by trying to summarize it, so you should just go watch it yourself. But to keep continuity, one of the big takeaways I got from his speech was that Will felt that all of the things Teddy tried to help him through, not letting other people's judgments crush you, not needing to be perfect, not letting the comparisons to the other twin lead you to guilt or feeling lesser, she ended up taking with her too. She felt that she was being judged all the way up to her death, and she didn't let herself help herself. Now, Will just hopes when he reaches the end of the game, and by proxy as Teddy is closer to the end of her life, that he'd see her move a little closer into breaking the surface herself. He ends it by saying he'll be back more in Act 2. Alright, this part might seem awkwardly placed, but I'd actually written the script before I had planned to put this in here. Before I move on, uh, to any sort of thematic or technical analysis of Diminish, now that we've finished the main Act 1, uh, I think it would be a good time to introduce this clip. I reached out to Sayria to see if there's anything he'd like to share with new viewers, and like the awesome person he is, he recorded a whole ass video for me. So, here's some context straight from the creator of Diminish, Sayria Song. Hi everybody, I'm Saria. I'm the person behind everything that is Diminish. I am Will, and I'm not. Same goes for Teddy. Diminish is an unfiction series. I discovered after the Nightmind video essay on Diminish that leagues of people would be really jarred and, and gutted by that. And if that's you, I, I really want to do my best to help you grapple with all of that as time goes on. But regardless of who you are and what any of this means to you, Sagan gave me the opportunity to provide my own input for you in this video. And that is the greatest mistake he ever made because here I am. Are you ready? Whew. Uh, I'll hopefully keep all of this geared toward a point, which is adding my context, which might help you face whatever it is you're facing or, or go after that passion that you really want to do. Maybe it's an unfiction project. Um, but hopefully my weird intensity doesn't come off pretentiously. That'd really suck. Anyway, the experience of this web series has been everything all at once. There's, there's nothing quite like the perfect juxtaposition of the terror of suddenly having my most intimate everything exposed in front of uncontrollable amounts of people, combined with the despair of knowing I should never actually put myself directly on that stage because it's not for me, it's for Will and Teddy. And, and yet, even just me existing parallel to that stage has still been hard for other people because if they believe Diminish was 100% a true story and they find out it's not in the way that they thought, that can be a complex and terrible thing. And I wasn't ready for any of this at all. And, and if you're privy to me talking about this experience in the past, you'll have heard me say constantly that Diminish was really just meant to be me screaming into a pillow, and maybe five other people would ever stick with it. Now that a couple more people are watching, I find myself really often in positions where I don't know if I can look to other projects or people for guidance in this specific situation. I can't really go to anyone and say, Hey, I might have just permanently scarred thousands of people because they connected to my invasively personal web series purely on the basis that it was following entirely real people and events. Got any hot tips? Like, I, I feel strongly that because I don't have that guidance, I need to fill that void and provide as many resources as I can muster. So that if you need to scream into a pillow and post it on the internet as an unfiction project, 
you won't have to face the music all by yourself. So I just want you to know that that that's coming, hopefully, in as many forms as, as I can provide. But even on the barest possible level, there's something that all of us are all facing together, and that's being alive on Earth in the year 2022. And that kind of places all of us in a spot that we really weren't designed to live in, I don't think. I really don't think that we as a species are up to the task of being immediately in contact with billions of strangers on any whim. And globally speaking, we are hardly improving at being good to each other. And that doesn't really help us when we're facing our own individual challenges. The digital age is possibly one of the most entropic we've ever faced. And all this to say, when you're more confused than you've ever been, I don't think that's a bad thing. I really don't. Not knowing answers doesn't make you bad or wrong. Most times, answers don't exist. And part of the human condition is wanting to force things into having answers, which makes us feel better and usually causes unknowable harm. It's, it's hard to let go of answers when you think you found them. Whatever it is you're up against right now, I just wanted to say that I, I think that oftentimes as human beings, one of the most important things that we can do in our lives is to sit with questions. Being uncertain and scared and, and powerless is so often where you learn the most. I think a lot of people who connect most with Diminish are, are often so, so run down by, by everything, for every reason under the sun. No pun intended. <laughs> so many Diminish community members have goals and dreams and identities that this world makes it seem impossible to have. And if it helps any of you at all, Diminish was the thing that I made because I was so run down, I never knew if I'd ever be able to do anything else. Diminish was kind of my desperate final scream, like it is Teddy's, and people heard it, and here I am. I guess, I guess screams are designed to reach more people. So I suppose maybe that's the point, finally, maybe that's the point. Don't be ashamed of listening to your scream, of, of letting yourself scream, of following it, and don't look for easy answers to shut it up. You're screaming for a reason. We're designed to scream for a reason. It's, it's one of the most genuine things you can do. I let my screaming create diminish, and it led us here. It's a scary thing to indulge. It's, it hurts more than ever when people try to shut down your most desperate state. And that's why you need a good support system. And that's not easy. It's also so easy to damage other people's eardrums, metaphorically. And that's why you need to scream mindfully. And that's not easy. Everything in life is more complicated than we want it to be, despite how enticing apparent simplicity looks. And maybe I'm not the best person to listen to, because I'm one of the biggest overcomplicators ever born in the history of humanity, but that's the thing about free will. You don't have to listen to me at all. Every moment of your life is yours. And someday it all ends. I wish you luck in finding your peace until then. Thanks so much. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you to Sayria for recording such a well thought out clip for this video. I really appreciate it. All right, now back to your regularly scheduled program. All right, that is act one. Act two is still ongoing and I'll touch on it a little bit at the end, but I wanna save it mostly for a standalone video. It's so many things and it deals with so much. Anxiety, grief, loss, depression, love, hate, societal norms. Uh, bullying, world conflict, just so much. And it's all just so well done. And I'm really excited to talk about the thematic elements of it. But first, uh, let's stew on it a little bit and talk about the more presentation and storytelling techniques that the series uses.
So like I said, I want to take this section to just talk about how well the format of this series is used to tell the story. Because the thing that makes Diminish so interesting to me isn't just the thematic elements of the story it's telling. I mean, that's a big part of it, but there are tons of stories being told in nonfiction all the time. But they end up having their execution be either mediocre or lackluster. But Diminish is genuinely fantastic in the way that it presents itself. So let's talk about Diminish's presentation and storytelling techniques. To start, let's talk about the visuals. Now, while in canon the game is made by a separate person than the one who's playing it, that is not the case in reality. Seiria is doing all of the art, music, and writing for the series. So let's talk about the art. Diminish Act 1 is almost completely grayscale, with a few exceptions like Teddy's red background. These splashes of color really catch your eye when they do happen, and that is especially true of the ending, and as we go into Act 2. The water at the end of Act 1 is this pinkish purple color, and the sky is a sunset-esque orange. That sudden change from the monotony of gray, similarly in the sudden splashes of red when Teddy appears, is really jarring and makes you focus hard on what's happening on screen. It's almost like a jump scare, creating an eerie or relief leaving feeling depending on the context. Outside of just its relation to the other colors, using mostly grayscale and drab imagery for the environments helps hammer home the monotony of the game itself, and the dark undertone of the context it was created in. Dying over and over in these bleak, black and white environments, it really helps drive home this feeling of despair. And let's not forget the designs. Starting with Apollo, despite being in incredible shape, there is a sense that it's not his peak. His body is strong, but somehow still has the look of someone who has muscles, but not much fat on their bones, an athlete who's been starving. This very much mirrors Teddy's before and after split in the art of the diminished soundtrack. And speaking of how the visuals tie into Teddy, let's talk about these weird growths. Aside from the comb boys, the other main enemy type, the thing that seems to be overtaking this wasteland that was once flowing with a river, are these strangely organic growths. I don't think it's a coincidence that the version of Teddy we see that she uses to represent herself is being slowly consumed by this parasitic tree. And the way this thing corrupts other people has turned the environment into a wasteland, overtaking its victims and slowly destroying their sanity and sense of self, it's too close a parallel between Teddy's cancer for me to think it's just a coincidence. All of this is to say, the visuals tie in both thematically in the setting and the tone perfectly. And again, all of this art is done by Seiria, one person doing this whole series. It's wild. Moving on, let's talk about audio and music. I want to start with the non-music audio first, because the music is just amazing and I want to have extra time to talk about it. First off, the sound effects. There's not too much to say here, but that's not a bad thing. All of the sounds fit perfectly with the vibe of the level, and I really like the aesthetic it goes for. Lots of the sounds remind me of classic anime sound effects, and it adds a lot of personality. Also, I want to mention Will's mic. When I first heard it, my first thought genuinely was, this dude should join Vine Sauce. I don't know, something about the way it sounds reminds me of that. But it fits the whole experience of playing this obscure game. Also, getting to hear the cat every time he shows up is a nice touch and does genuinely ease the tension at times. Okay, now I can talk about the music. The soundtrack is a perfect mix of eerie industrial ambience and beautifully arranged pianos and synths. It can go from completely creepy to heroic and epic. It perfectly fits all the scenes, it almost feels film-like, and in line with the classic anime sound effects, there are times that it almost sounds like a Ghibli soundtrack. At the same time, it never leaves the realm of video game soundtrack, and it feels right at home in this post-apocalyptic platformer, while still being a really unique sound. The soundtrack of Act 1 is posted on the channel right now, and I'd highly recommend you give it a listen. Okay, one of the last things I want to talk about in this section is some of the ways the story is told through the presentation, and the devices it uses to explore its themes. One really clear example of this is how the status changes with Will's mood, which I mentioned before. In another way that the themes mirror themselves in Will is how Will talks about the game. Often when trying to calm himself about a particularly frustrating part of the game or to hype himself up for trying something risky, Will will make observations about the process of playing the game that, out of context, could genuinely be advice on how to deal with things like the grieving process or mental health struggles. It's just like making progress in this stupid game. It's not a- I can't expect to get all the way to the end, like, on a single attempt when I don't know what's ahead. I just have to take baby steps, and taking another step, and not dying before the first freaking jump, is a victory. 
It's one of the reasons this game's genre works so well for this type of story. It's why he includes so much of him dying, because that is also a really important part of getting this process across to the viewer, and one way we can feel the emotions along with Will. Another thing I find really interesting is Will's slow introduction of editing, from comedic timing to more interesting transitions. Not only does it give a good in-universe explanation for why the series does so many cliffhangers, it also can tell us a lot about how Will is doing. He's slowly becoming more comfortable being an entertainer, and while initially I wasn't sure how to feel about the edits being introduced in such a somber context, as we learn about Teddy and Will's relationship, it feels pretty fitting, and probably something Teddy would have encouraged or expected when she tasked him with uploading his playthrough. One of her big messages to Will so far has been to be himself, and that includes his sense of humor. And really, there is a good sense of humor in this series. This game is actually going to kill me! I'm coming, Teddy! Speaking of Teddy and Will's relationship, there's a choice that I think is really interesting. Will never reads the dialogue out loud. He lets it play silently and then responds. To me, this is actually really important. He's not just reading text, he's having a conversation. And Teddy and Will are not the same person, so he leaves room for Teddy's, in quotes, voice to talk. And I think it's really important that he makes sure his voice is not the same as Teddy's. It really helps Teddy feel like her own character. Last thing I want to touch on is how well Seiria plays the character of Will. Now, some of this comes from the fact that Seiria really is raging at the game much of the time, and he has a really great ability to be convincing as someone who's never played the game. Game, despite being literally the creator of the game. On the note of Seria putting a lot of himself into the series, I think that's what makes the series so impactful, or at least one of the reasons. Teddy's thoughts, Will's thoughts, clearly coming from somewhere very real. And I think splitting up these ideas throughout multiple characters, from Teddy to Will to Apollo, and having them interact as if they're coming from different people, really makes it so much more interesting than if they were all coming from the same source. Okay, one last little thing. While the story of this series is maybe more straightforward than some of the fiction series you might be used to, that doesn't mean it's completely devoid of secrets. From secret faces that sometimes appear in the menu, to terrifying render frames, to images of graveyards, giving these creepy little things to surprise you was really great. Plus, there was the mysterious Morse code. Aside from that though, there's also this really cool hidden message in the bio section at one point. Artemis, her. I miss her. It adds a little more connection to the in-game story about Apollo, which at this point, I'm also genuinely invested into, especially as we get into Act 2. There are probably more little hidden secrets that I haven't touched on, so if you notice any, let me know. Okay, that's it for this section. For now, let's move on to the part where I've, well, let's move on to the part we've all been waiting for, a thematic breakdown. For this section, I'm basically just going to run down my takeaways and thoughts about the themes that are explored in this series, so this is more of my interpretation than it is the facts about the series. As I've mentioned, it's really important the genre of game that has been chosen. Rage games, as funny as it sounds for a video game, take you on an emotionally difficult journey. I mean, just look at some people when they snap playing these games. Oh my god! I'm done! Oh god! Fuck! No, oh my god! It's real. So, if the game brings you so much turmoil and anger, what is the merit? Why play them? Well, the answer is simple. Catharsis. It's about overcoming something difficult, because the fact that it's hard is what makes the feeling of actually completing it so much more powerful. Some people don't like the fact that Will includes so much of the dying and being stuck in the boring part of the series, but I think it's not only important for the message, but an integral part of the experience. It takes you on the journey as well, and for me, I found it really enjoyable and engrossing. Another reason it's so important to watch it all is because you can see Will's process in real time. Like I mentioned in the last section, Will often comes to a certain epiphany about the game that relates directly to his own process of grief and mental health. Processing grief, or overcoming mental health struggles, or beating diminish, is not a linear process. You'll make progress, then fall back, then take another step forward, then another step back. You're constantly struggling, but by the time you've moved forward on one thing, you've mastered that thing. Something that seemed impossible before is suddenly as easy as muscle memory. It's not a straight line of getting better. It's slow and has ups and downs, but eventually you'll look back at things you used to struggle with and realize, huh, 
that's not so bad anymore. And sometimes you'll get stuck back there again and go, I thought I already knew how to deal with this. But eventually you'll conquer it and you'll be faster than last time. In Will's words, taking another step and not dying, that is a victory. You're going to mess up sometimes, sometimes a lot, but you need to mess up to learn. One of the best examples of this theme in the story is Diminish 8 to 9, which I already discussed a bit before, but it's such a masterpiece and touches on so much. In some ways, it's depressing. It tells us that the world continues before, during, and after our death, uncaring. It lets you stew in the shock of being confronted with your own mortality, despite Apollo not really being able to die. But it takes these ideas and turns them motivational. The pain that Will is feeling from the loss of Teddy is something he can learn to live with, to turn into something else. The pain he feels means he's still alive. It will stay with him forever and he'll have to carry it, but he can grow from it. It's undoubtedly painful, but, and I know these seem like odd examples, but considering the context of the series, I think it makes sense. Just like speedrunning, just like that one last death in a rage game, just like one more attempt at an athletic feat. If you have survived, you have to keep going. It's something that Seiria has talked about more openly as a personal philosophy. A broad sense of self-actualized existentialism that um, I tend to cling to often in my own mindset. Um, that sort of notion of you're alive, you can do anything. As long as you're alive, you can do anything. As long as you're alive, you have the ability to make progress. Or that's what I got from it. I don't want to misinterpret Seria's words. Moving on for a sec away from Will, let's talk about what it explores from Teddy's point of view. From early on with the lobster bisque soup of the day, we can see what it is that Teddy is dealing with on her own. Watching those lobsters boil alive as she watches herself draw closer to the same fate, confronting your own death. And we see this everywhere. Justin, the skull, is a pretty direct reference to death. I'm coming after you. Would you prefer to know? One of the hardest hitting lines that talks about this to me is, she wants to kill God with her bare hands. She prays. She has nowhere to turn as the inevitable encroaches, and that panic that initially sets in leaves her in a state of switching between wanting to kill whatever force put her here to pleading with it. But as the series goes on, we learn more about how she's dealing with the impact of her death. At one point, Apollo mentions fearing the consequences of his touch. To me, this connects with Teddy's own worry about the impact of her death, especially on Will. She's tried her whole life to save him, and now, she might be the thing that tips him over the edge. And the fear of doing that is what motivates her to do this in the first place. Because she has no ability to save herself, her goal is still survival, just not for herself. She wants to make sure that Will, someone who will undoubtedly suffer greatly from this, survives what her death will do to him. She cannot let her own death be his as well. This one-to-one -one connection between her death being his is further enforced by the theme of twins, from the fact that Teddy and Will are in fact twins to Apollo and Artemis, who, if you'll remember, is mysteriously missing and Apollo misses. And I think her worrying extends twofold, from the real risk that Will may take his own life to his internal death. She talks a lot about Will's passions being constantly put down, and as kids, she constantly tries her best to support him. Now that she's gone, she can't let it destroy him. The last thing I want to touch on here is the fact that there's a lot of Will coming across and confronting characters in the world that are not in a good state. Dying, hurt, depressed. It even forces you to step on them. It clearly makes Will uncomfortable to confront. And I have a couple thoughts about this. First, I think it's trying to hold up a mirror to Will. When you don't allow yourself to help yourself, that isn't selflessness. And like I mentioned earlier, when I came across these guys initially, if you can't help yourself, you can't help anyone. And that's not selfless, is it? At the same time, I think it also forces Will to confront the ugly parts of life, which we see in other sections like Diminish 14. And not just confronting them, but accepting them. Not being stagnant or not trying to help or make the world a better place, but understanding that things aren't always going to be good. Being okay with things just being. Reaching catharsis and acceptance and happiness even when things aren't going to be okay all the time. And to me, that's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. The value of life isn't measured in how happy you are, what percentage of the time you're happy. And I think even if we don't think it consciously, I think we often fall into a trap of measuring how happy we are as a core measurement of life, or worse, how useful we are. Which is a way that you can fall into eugenics or dehumanizing people who aren't 
useful. And this is coming from me, someone whose goal in life is be generally happy most of the time. It's not that happiness or quality of life isn't important, but we're not always going to be happy or utilitarianly useful, but that doesn't mean our lives have less value. Really quickly, last thing I want to touch on is Diminish 14. As I mentioned, a lot of people thought that Diminish 14 was for shock value. It wasn't. Thematically, it ties in with things not being okay, and grieving not just interpersonally, but existentially, and trying to find meaning when things are so bad. But character development-wise, it's important that Teddy shared her ugliest and angriest thoughts with Will. They trusted each other with everything, so Teddy couldn't tone it down or pretty it up. She had to be 100% honest with Will or he wouldn't have got the same closure. Okay, those are my thoughts put as succinctly as possible. Again, this is just my personal interpretation. I don't want to say this is the end-all be-all or misinterpret any of Saria's thoughts. This is just what I gathered. So what else is there to talk about? We've pretty exhaustively covered Act 1 so far. Well, before we move on to briefly touching on Act 2, I just want to look at some parallels and cross-analyze, diminish with some other interesting games and series, because there's actually a lot to draw from that. So let's get into that. Okay, so let's look at some other games and pieces of media that have interesting parallels or I have something interesting to say about them in the context of Diminish. Also, if you've finished Diminish and you're just looking for uh, more good content, consider these all suggestions. Now, obviously series like Petscop are obvious choices, and as far as I can tell, Petscop did inspire Seiria quite a bit. But let me start with something a little weirder. Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy is a rage game created by prolific Flash game creator Bennett Foddy. Now, I think the only other game bigger than this that he's made is Quop, so that may give you an idea of the type of thing he's up to if you hadn't heard of Getting Over It. On the surface, there are some pretty immediate connections to make between Diminish and Getting Over It. First off, it's a rage game. Getting Over It is a game where you are a man in a pot trying to climb to the top of a mountain with a hammer. The thing is, it's incredibly difficult and and at any moment, any wrong move, you could fall all the way back to the bottom, and there are no checkpoints. Aside from its purposefully frustrating nature, the game also features Bennett Foddy, the game's creator, narrating to the player, much like how Teddy provides narration and insight to Will. It's this fourth wall break that makes the game itself have a sort of personality, specifically as an extension of the developer. But there's a more thematic element I think is interesting to look at. While not the most tactful way of putting it, Diminish is also sort of about getting over it. I mean, of course that's an oversimplification, but I don't think it's an entirely unfair statement. The game's use of this mountain is really just an excuse to put the player through this gauntlet of challenge, because it's really about what the player experiences more than it is about telling a straightforward story about climbing a mountain. As the blurb on the Steam page says, a game I made for a certain kind of person to hurt them. Now, that may be for more malicious purposes than Diminish, but this game is also made for a specific audience, just not one person specifically. And the only way to get over the mountain is by getting over the fear and anger of failure and just keep trekking. There's no way you'll make it up without falling back down countless times unless you're like a savant. So much in parallel to Diminish, it's about accepting the hardship and pushing forward, getting over it. There's another game that uses climbing a mountain as a device to explore the topic of overcoming hardship. It's a precision platformer like Diminish, and it even uses some of the same text effects Diminish uses later in the series. Celeste is a 2018 precision platformer where you take the role of Madeline, a young woman who attempts to trek to the top of Celeste Mountain. And much like Diminish, Celeste also takes a very realistic focus on mental health struggles and portrays them in a realistic way with the protagonist. It also seems like these perspectives in both pieces of media come from a place of experience with the creator. But back to the mountain. Like Diminish and getting over it, Celeste is very much about the same issue. Climbing the mountain, overcoming your struggle, getting over it. And very specifically with Diminish, the theme of taking pain with you that Diminish 8 to 9 has is very much explored in Celeste as well. The main antagonist of Celeste is Madeline's alter ego named Badeline by the community. 
She's all the bad parts of Madeline that escaped through a mirror imbued with the power of a mountain. Throughout the whole game, Madeline tries to overcome her by pushing her away, letting her go. But in the end, about two thirds of the way through the game, it just doesn't work, and Madeline knocks Madeline back to the bottom of the mountain, in a moment that is reminiscent of the break the surface moment in Diminish. And similarly to what Diminish explores, this fall really encapsulates the idea that your journey into self-improvement or overcoming a challenge isn't linear. It's not steady progress all the times. Sometimes you take two steps forwards, a hundred steps back. That doesn't mean you failed. What matters is that you keep pushing forward, just like getting over it, where you can fall all the way back at any time. But importantly, just like in Diminish 8 to 9, after Madeline falls, the way she's able to get back up to the top, and even quicker than before, is that Madeline and her evil self actually make up and make faster progress, and begin learning and progressing in a healthier way. It's not about pushing pain away. You have to take it with you and turn it into something. In the case of Celeste, that's literally giving you another dash jump. But the important thing to note here is how each of these games tackles the idea of progressing through hardship. But there's one more game I want to talk about here. Where Celeste is closer related to Diminish's main themes, it doesn't include one thing that Diminish and Getting Over It include. The developer-player dichotomy. The narrative being explored through the developer letting you know they're there. In the beginner's guide created by Davey Reedon, the creator of the Stanley Parable, we see this explored twofold. Hey there, Editor Sagan here. I sort of just went into a big long analysis of the beginner's guide without actually giving context to what that game is, so Here's the context, spoiler alert. A fictionalized version of Davy talks the player through a series of abstract games created by a developer he knew named Coda. As you play through, Davy tries to make sense of the games, making pretty big assumptions about Coda in the process, to the degree that it definitely feels like crossing a line. Davy also changes the games to be more playable for you as you go through, with the idea that he's improving them. As the story goes on, he reveals that he never actually got permission to release Coda's games, and he continues to confess that he was really sharing the game as a way to feel important, like he was doing something worthwhile, sharing Coda's work with the world, all the while completely disregarding Coda's feelings about it. And it's revealed that Coda stopped making games because of it. And the whole time, Davy desperately is looking for meaning in Coda's games, unable to understand how someone would make art without wanting to find an audience for it. That's my basic rundown. Anyway, what's so interesting about the beginner's guide in Diminish is how similar yet different they are. Diminish's developer and player relationship is that of two twins who love each other and the game was made for Will. In the beginner's guide, it's an adversarial relationship. See, while there is a surface level connection between Davy being the narrator and the person playing the game being the player, it's better to look at it as Davy being the player and the actual developer, Coda, as being the developer role we're more like the audience. Now, a huge part of the message of the beginner's guide is about misinterpreting art, so like, disclaimer, I could be wrong, but in my view, the game is about Davy completely misinterpreting what Coda had intended. Instead of the game being made for him, the games were made for no one specifically, just art that really only Coda knows the meaning to, if there is any. In the case of Diminish, it's the exact opposite. The game was made for that player. There's also the second-hand aspect of the audience. In both cases, we as the audience are witnessing it after the developer and then after the initial player. It's a nearly identical format, but in the case of Diminish, the two characters, player and creator, are the closest two people can get. They know each other wholly and are each other's most trusted person. It's pure honesty that is put into the game. In the beginner's guide, it's the opposite. Davy doesn't even really know Coda, not even seeming to get the implication that Coda is probably a woman. And the game, as we see it, is anything but honest, with Davy making alter to push his own narrative for the viewer, completely disrespecting the developer's initial intentions. In the same way though, the player, Davey, is using the games as a way to cope with mental illness, although it's a wildly different effect in healthiness than in Diminish. Davy takes advantage of his relationship with Coda to make himself feel important, to fill a void, while Will is being guided through the experience purposefully by Teddy. As well, the Beginner's Guide seems to criticize the idea of making judgments on a person based on your interpretation of their art, while Diminish in some portions gives Will a look directly into Teddy's mind on purpose. And in a meta sense, Diminish is very much an exploration of Saria's internal feelings split into these two characters. Similarly, at least in my opinion, the Beginner's Guide does the same, showing two sides of being a game developer, both wanting to make art for the sake of it and not worrying about what other people think, and also yearning for that attention and adoration. It's just wild to me how similar these projects are, yet completely different at the same time. I could go into a whole standalone video about Diminish and the Beginner's Guide just comparing them, and maybe I will, but for now, 
those are some interesting parallels to chew on. All right, we're nearing the end of the road. The last thing to do really is just briefly touch on act two and what's going on with that. Uh, but I want to save most of it for a standalone video and you should just go watch it yourself. So let's briefly talk about Act 2. It picks up right where we left off in Act 1, in the water. Not only does this act so far have a lot more color, but for those of you who didn't like the boring parts of Act 1, buckle up boyos because the beginning of this act is even more monotonous. But again, I actually enjoyed it. The beginning largely takes place in the water, but eventually the levels start changing with water still being a recurring theme. Something I'm really liking so far is how it's expanding Apollo's story. We're learning a lot more about Apollo and Artemis, and there's way more recurring characters for Apollo to interact with. On Will and Teddy's side, things are getting a lot darker in tone, especially recently. The high highs of Diminish are on pause, in favor of genuinely eerie and depressing sequences, mostly punctuated with really well-written interludes showing Apollo's story. So far, I think it's genuinely improvement over Act 1, if that's possible. I honestly don't have a lot of critiques for Act 1, but all of that context going into this act really upped the stakes, and it probably helps that I'm able to follow this one as it's being released. And while I do like Act 1's bleak aesthetic, I think the added color of this act is pretty welcome. I also like that the gameplay is being expanded with the solar flare. It just feels like in all aspects, Act 2 is expanding on Act 1 in a really great way. And again, I don't want to spoil too much because you should just go watch it. So, go watch it. Okay, that's my look at Diminish Act 1. Um, what am I going to do next? Well, initially I was thinking about doing a Sea of Thieves video, um, but now uh, I'm thinking about maybe just fully going straight ahead and starting my RPG Maker series, uh, starting with Yume Niki, um, and maybe putting off the Sea of Thieves video until later. I also just, again, want to quickly shout out my Spotify, my Twitter, my second channel, you know, the regular stuff. Uh, oh, also, all of the, the soundtrack to this video should also be on Spotify by now, or if it's not, it should be in the next couple days. Oh, and my uh, album of original music, if you liked Morbid Curiosity, which was my first sort of rough EP trying to do something, this is me sort of stretching my wings a little bit more, trying to explore some more genres, so if you liked Morbid Curiosity, maybe you'll like this, and if you don't care about my original music, then, I mean, understandable. I'm a YouTuber. Enough of that, though. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Seiria, for making a fantastic project. And thank you to my anonymous friend for introducing me to what is quickly becoming my favorite unfiction series. See you all next time. Ah!